just as we were singing that song, I was really had a sense that that's something for us as a church to consider. And I think it's easy to look around the world and go, yeah, there's a lot of uh, pressing and crashing going on in all sorts of different ways. But I just had a sense that as we were singing that collectively, that maybe as we look to the future, I think the idea of laying down old flames, taking up new ways of being, can be really important. And I guess a new year always stirs that opportunity to sort of recalibrate, to think a little bit and go, oh, what, 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 what will it look like going forward? You know, because I think most of us probably get to the new year and go, well, what do we want to be different? Um, and that also applies to our faith and what that looks like. And in life, there are always opportunities. There are always opportunities to grow, to serve, to, to bless and be blessed, uh, to work, to play. There are always opportunities. But, you know, the one thing that often is the most contributing factor is whether or not we have the capacity or the time to take up those new things around us. There have been uh, plenty of studies done over the time, uh, over the years, about what factors are most likely to influence a person's ability to stop and help others. And uh, these studies have involved numerous people with different religious beliefs and backgrounds and passions, and they all came out that the biggest factor in people's willingness to help others isn't their religious persuasion, no matter how passionate they might be, but it's about how much time they have. Now, you would all know that we all get given the same amount of time every week, right? There aren't a special group of people who get an extra 10 hours in their week. We think there are, but they're not. We all have the same amount of time. But when we feel pressed for time, when we're in a hurry, then we're less likely to be able to pause and to help others. And I would even suggest we're even less likely to notice someone else who has a need because we're so focused on where we're going and what we're about. You see, in life, we need margin. Margin is the area in our lives that aren't used up. We need space in our life, and really what we need is space for grace. Because let's face it, when we stop to help or engage or to be present to others, we are offering grace to them. We're starting a new series through January, and it's called Make Room. And over the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the areas in life where we can increase our margins. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands that goes, who thinks they've got margin in life? Because that's just, you know, that will be outing some people. Um, but, you know, how, how, what does a margin in our life look like? How much extra space do we have in our lives? We're going to be looking at a passage from 2 Kings 8 to 17 uh, for this series. It's only a small passage, um, but... Within it, we'll find some really useful lessons as we think about what it looks like. And today's topic is making room for God. So we're going to start uh, by reading this passage from 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, starting at uh, verse 8. And this is an account of Elisha and the woman, woman from Shunem. One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there from, for something to eat. She said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, table, a chair and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant, Gehazi, Tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elijah said to Gehazi, Tell her, we appreciate the kind concern that you have shown to us. What can we do for you? Can we put a good word in for you with the king or the commander of the army? No, she replied, my family takes good care of me. Later, Elijah asked Gehazi, What can we do for her? Gehazi replied, She doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. That's a bit brutal, isn't it? Pull her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her, as she stood in the doorway, next year at this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried. O man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at the, that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. 
Now, some of you might be familiar with this story, and you would know that as it goes on, she does indeed have a son, and then a few years later, the son becomes sick and, and dies. And so she calls for the prophet, and the prophet comes, and he prays for her son, and her son is resurrected. And so we see within the story, there's, there's a whole lot that goes on around God, who God is, what God does, and the relationship between this woman and the man of God. And so we, uh, we're going to be exploring this over the next few weeks. And so today it's around making room for God. And we could look at this passage and literally say, let's build a room, right? Because that's what happens in the story. She builds a room for the man of God to be able to come and stay. But that's, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting we're going to build a little room at the side where we can meet with God. Because it's different today. See, in her time, the only way that you could hear from God was through the prophet. They were God's voice to the people. And so if you wanted to hear from God, you needed to know a prophet, essentially. Well, we know for us today, that's very different. We have all sorts of ways in which we can hear from God. Uh, There is the Bible, which we can read, and that is God's word to us. The Holy Spirit engages with us. It brings the scriptures alive to us. It brings things out. It, It will sow things into our lives where we become aware of them. We have access to Jesus. We can simply pray and ask Jesus for his insight, his wisdom in so many areas. When Jesus was crucified at that Easter event, one of the significant things that took place was the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And what that signified was that to hear from God, you no longer needed the man of God to go in on your behalf and come out and tell you what God had said. All of a sudden, everyone, everyone has access to God. It's no longer hidden away in the Holy of Holies. So it's a really significant moment that happens at Easter, and I think we need to really appreciate it, particularly in this story, when we're looking at the Old Testament, when that was very much the case. And so we all have access now to God. In fact, I would suggest we have so much access to the things of God today that sometimes we're overwhelmed. There's podcasts, there's books, there's so many different translations of the Bible. There are all sorts of ways in which we can hear from God. But we need to take the opportunity to hear from God. In this account, we find a couple of characters. There is Elisha, the prophet, the man of God, and then there is the Shunammite woman. And this woman, as the scripture tells us, is a wealthy woman. So that means that she would not have wanted for anything. In fact, when she's asked, what can we do for you? She's like, you you don't need to do anything for me. My family take good care of me. She had all the trappings that the world could offer. She was well taken care of. But although she had all that was there, she noticed that there was something else that she wanted and she made room for God in her life. There are many people in the world who spend their whole lives looking to fill that void, looking to fill that gap in their life. And it can be through success or fame or fortune or all sorts of ways. Education, relationships, all of these can be things that people try and fill that space that only God can fill. So this wealthy woman, she decided to make room for God despite all that she had. You could probably look at her life from the outside and go, she's got it all together. She's got all that you could want. And yet, she makes the choice to pursue God, to pursue God over the things of the world. What about us? Do we make room for God in our lives, or do we still pursue the things of the world over the things of the kingdom? So the first part that we're looking at today in this is making room for God. It starts with an invitation. It starts with an invitation. This woman from Shunem, what does she do? She urges Elisha, the man of God, to come to her house for a meal. It's an invitation. Come to my place. Come and be present with us. She was obviously aware of the prophet's movements and where he would be. And so she kind of got to a place where they were cross paths and made sure that she could invite him in. I want to encourage you in the coming weeks to make the effort to seek out God to stalk God. You might do that by being in places where God will be. Now, God is everywhere, right? He's everywhere. That's part of his nature, part of his character. When we become a follower of Jesus, then God becomes part of our lives. He's, he becomes part of us. The Spirit indwells us. Yet there are times when we're able to see and hear God more 
where we're more attentive to him. The soul food resource that we put out before Christmas has some of that intent behind it, that we would be put ourselves in places where we could be more present to God, where we are open to God more than what we might be in just our regular rhythm of what we do. So in the coming weeks, I want to challenge you to make space for God to speak. In your days and weeks and months, if they are so full of stuff and noise and people and events, then I want to encourage you to, in your day, to invite God into that quiet place in your life. When uh, Ros and I, if we want to have a meaningful conversation, then we know that you know, you, it's hard to have a meaningful conversation when you're at a concert and the music's blaring, right? It's hard to have a meaningful conversation when you're at the movies. It's near impossible to have a meaningful conversation with me if the footy's on or I'm checking my email. For us to have a meaningful conversation, there needs to be quiet and space and intent behind it. Uh, God likes the quiet. He likes our attention. It's in 1 Kings 19 that we read about Elijah and he stands and he waits for God to speak, and it's not in the earthquake, and it's not in the wind, and it's not in the fire. Some of you know this. It's in the still, quiet whisper of the wind, isn't it, that God speaks. Sometimes to get our attention, God speaks in the chaos, doesn't he? I'm sure as most of you have experienced that at some form or another. When life is chaotic, God will get your attention some one way or another. But if we want to invite God into our lives, we invite him into those quiet spaces, that are just for him, just for him to be present. For some of us, that's tough because we, we're the doers, right? We like to do stuff all the time. That's how we feel productive. That's how we feel useful. We do stuff. And so the invitation to be still, to pause, to listen to God, it's like, man, that's like going to the dentist because it's, we're not wired that way. But I want to suggest that we're not wired that way because we haven't practiced what it is to be still because sometimes when we're still and when we pause and we re when we reflect we notice things about ourselves that we probably don't like as much as we probably should we become aware of some of our bigger failings and so sometimes it's just easier to keep busy to keep active I'm always surprised, I'm not always surprised, but I always notice that whenever I'm out and about, that people have these things in their ears these days. Have you noticed that? And they're always listening to something. And, and it might be a really helpful podcast, or it might be some great worship music, or some other things like that, but it's still not stillness and quiet, is it? When do we become still? When do we become quiet? When do we allow the voices in our head to quieten down that we allow the Holy Spirit to be present? And it's really challenging. I know when I first came across the practice of stillness, uh, there was someone who was sort of helping and, and guiding me in this, and it was like, you know, and she was like, well, you know, let's start small. Let's start with five minutes. I've got to tell you, that first five minutes felt like forever. But after a while, as you start to practice it, you kind of go, oh, I can do this a bit more. And I start to become in tune with God and I start to appreciate the solitude and the quiet and the presence of God. So making room for God is an invitation. Do we invite God in? How do we invite God in? The next one is make room for God happens in community, which is kind of almost a little bit separate to what we just talked about. We need the stillness, but we also need other people. Here the woman says to her husband, let us build a room. Husbands out there, let me ask you a question. What does it mean when your wife says, let us paint, clean out the cupboard, do the garden? What, what does that mean? And, and sometimes it is truly a collaboration. Sometimes. Sometimes the collaboration is, I'll hold the paint. I'll, I'll cheer you on. I'll get you that glass of water while the other stuff's going. But there's still a collaboration, isn't there? In our house, it's like someone does the planning Someone does the work, and often it works well. Because you need one another, right, to be able to do things well. But 
when do we when do we join in with others and i guess many of you would know that christianity is best done in community so often we make it personal we talk about our personal relationship with jesus and when you start to poke and prod people and ask them about their faith journey sometimes they get a little bit well who are you to ask me about what my personal relationship with god is like i gotta tell you that's a very very small portion of the faith idea because faith is done in community do you know the old testament was written to the people of god not the person of god so the old testament was written to a community most of the new testament is written to the church not the person it was written to the community and what they would do is they'd take the letters that were written and they'd stand in front of a community and they'd read them out together And I don't know, but as you read some of those letters, some of them are pretty confronting. Can you imagine sitting in the church of Corinth when all of a sudden Paul gets really explicit about the sexual immorality that's going on? There's a few people sitting there going, this is awkward. But that's that's what it was. It was written to the community. Because faith is not meant to be lived out in isolation on our own. Now, if we want to discern what God is saying to us, it's it's to us. If you want to work out what God is saying to you, often it's in connection with other people. And sometimes we need other people around us to make sure that we're actually hearing from God. Because sometimes we have this great idea, and we kind of go, I think God is saying this, and if you've got really trusted, wise people around you, sometimes they'll say, yes, I affirm that. And sometimes they go, no, that's not what I'm hearing from God in this space. And so we need that connection. We need that community here. Did you know that in the New Testament, there are 59 commands that you can't do on your own? 59 commands that we cannot do on our own. They require other people to be involved. This is what some of them are. Love one another. Be at peace with one another. Some of you are thinking, I'm at peace with, other, with others when I'm on my own, right? So, but be at peace with one another. Encourage one another. Care for one another. Forgive one another. Submit to one another. And the list goes on and on. Commands that require other people to be involved. We can't just do it in isolation. The Christian life isn't meant to be alone. Now, being here on a Sunday is great. There are elements of community, the beginning of community that, that takes place here. But the depth of community helps o- happens outside of these times. In ministry over the years, Ros and I have seen some great things happen during church and around church. But we've come to know that what happens beyond Sundays is where the depth is built into people's lives. If our only experience of community is on Sunday, then we are selling ourselves short. Our faith journey is very, very small. We need to connect with others outside of our gatherings. Small groups, people we journey with, all of these are vital. They need, they're needed for, to involve God. Who do you pray with? Who are the people in your world who you pray with? Who do you serve with? One of the things I love about being in ministry is often, you know, the tasks that you do, you do with others, a collaboration. You plan together, you focus together, you pray together, you serve together. We need space for God to speak into our lives, but we need a community to work out our faith, to test what God is telling us and to move beyond that. So making room for God is best done in community. But making room for God also requires us to convert space that could be used for something else, to repurpose some things in our lives. When they decided to build a room on the roof, they were taking a space that would have been used for other things. Now, we look at the roofs around here and you kind of go, yeah, we're not building anything. We don't use that outside of the house, that portion. All it does is keep us dry and out of the elements. That's kind of the purpose of the roof, right? In the Middle East, the roof has a whole range of purposes. And this account is a very real and tangible application. They literally made a room for God, but there was a cost involved. How many of you have been involved in a building project? Anyone? Yeah. How many of you have seen every building project run on time to budget? (laughs) There's always a cost, isn't there? And there's hidden costs. Some of the costs we know up front, this is what it will be. But then once you pull something apart, once you start to dig around, you kind of go, oh, this is going to cost you more. 
there was a cost for them in this as they built something on their roof. It wasn't a dead space. They used it to store things, to, to dry food, and then days like today, they would sleep on the roof when it was nice and hot. So what they did was they repurposed that space. They could no longer use it for what it was. They, they dedicated that, created a space for the man of God to come. Jesus told his disciples that when they followed him, there was a cost involved. Actually, this morning, as I was doing my final preparation for today, this verse of the day popped up for me, and it was from Luke 9, 23 to 25. This is what it says. Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it, but if you give it up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? but yourself lost or destroyed. It came up this morning as I was sitting here. Oh, there it is. So the same is true for believers. There is a cost in following Jesus, isn't there? Some of this we know up front. We know that you know, to become part of a faith community, you know, there's probably an expectation that we might turn up to church. That's going to cost us time. It might get involved serving. Uh, we might want to contribute to the work of God financially. We might want to use our gifts. And so we know up front, but we also know that after a while, you kind of get enmeshed and you find out there's other things that you can do and there are other things that God calls us to as we go forward. If we're going to convert or repurpose space in our lives so we can make room for God, then there will be some costs involved. You might have to give up something so that you can be part of a growth group, a small group, and into a community. You might have to get up a little earlier so that you can have some quiet space for you and your family, uh, for you and God. You might need to change the day that you do something so that you can make room in your life for something else to happen. Now, there's a leadership principle that says if you say yes to one new thing, then you need to put two things down. Because what happens is often when you get asked to do something, you go, yeah, I can do that. And what, what you end up doing is you just keep adding things to your tasks. And of course, the principle is that if you just keep adding things to what you do, then eventually what happens? You, you have zero margin. Your capacity to actually function well in the task that you have before you starts to diminish. And so, you know, so if someone invites you to be part of a committee or something like that, it's like, what will you put down to be part of that? When we invite God into something, when we want to make room for God, what are we willing to put down, set aside, so we aren't just adding it to the list? Making room for God is going to cause us to convert some space. So we make space for God. And one of the realities is that when we make space for God, he'll fill it. Not with more tasks, not with more work, but with his presence, his grace, his compassion, and his mercy. So I want to step back from the making space from, for God thing. And just ask the question, why did this woman do this? Why did she notice the prophet, invite him to her place, build him a little room? Why did she do that? Well, she did it because of what might happen. When she was asked, is there anything you need? She was like, no, I'm all good. But as they dug a little deeper and he sort of declared, the prophet declared, you, you will have a son she was like, don't, don't get my hopes up. So she really wasn't seeking anything, but she was curious about what might happen. And as the story goes on, she would receive a word from God that she would have a son. She would have a son. That son would die, but then she would see the amazing miracle of God. I guess she saw two miracles, didn't she? One in the conception of a son, and then when God brings her son back again. So I encourage you to make room for God because of what might happen. We might encounter God. How many of you genuinely have a desire to encounter God? Or how many of you are a little bit, this is a rhetorical question, or how many of you are a little bit nervous? What if I actually did encounter God? What would it mean? I think sometimes we like to keep God at arm's distance because if we really invite him in there might be some transformation that happens there might be something 
incredibly powerful that happens. We may not be in control anymore. <gasps> How hard would that be? If you make space for God, we will learn things about his nature and character that will surprise you. And if we make space for God now when life is reasonably okay, when we get to the pointy end, when we get to those areas of our life that are a bit out of control, where we're not sure what's really happening, when we have a significant need, it's the practices we've done beforehand that actually prepare us for those times, to be able to rest in his grace and his presence. Rather than scrambling and going, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how God's going to be present to this. There's a, a great passage that many of you would know from James 4 verse 8 that says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You might be thinking, I'd like to do this, but how do I carve out the time to draw near to God? Well, notice in verse 10 of our reading, it said, they built a small room for him. Often when we think about God, we think big. We've got to dedicate all this time, we've got to do all these things, but I just want to encourage you, to start small. So often in faith, we make things big, right? Because God can do anything. And so we think big. But what does it look like to start small? You know, what are the small things that I can invite God into? Can I encourage you in the coming week to make a small step in this area and see what God will do? See how God fills the space. See how he takes the small that we can offer him and multiply it into something bigger. And I have to say that uh, after raising a family, as we've raised our family and so forth, that sometimes finding space is really hard. And so sometimes what we need to do is repurpose what we already do. So when you go for a walk, don't just go for a walk, go for a prayer walk. Combine prayer into what you do. Invite someone along when you're doing something. Start to build community got this little job to do ring a friend or two and go would you like to help and contribute and you start to build that relationship together one of the things I used to do was when you know I'd drive my kids to school a couple of days a week and and we'd pray in the car while we're going to school normally had my eyes open so that was okay but we just pray we give thanks for the sake that they had an education a place to go to school we give thanks for the things that are provided and the blessing we pray for their friends How many of you uh, eat a meal most days? Yeah? Yeah? Most days. What does it look like to invite someone over to your house for a meal once a week? Start to build that community. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I've noticed is that sometimes when we kind of go, well, let's have a meal together, all of a sudden you kind of go, oh, man, we've got to put on a dinner party. What does it look like for someone just to come and join your meal, whatever you're having that night? Maybe it's mince on toast. Who knew that was such a gourmet thing that you get it at cafes? <laughs> I gotta say, when I grew up, mince on toast was kind of like the leftovers that you got. And then when we, were, we came back on holiday to New Zealand one time, it was outside, it was like, today's special mince on toast. And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> but I see, it's everywhere. Mince on toast is a thing. Um, you know, what, does it, what does it look like to just you know, have a couple of people over and go, yeah, we're just, this is what we're doing. You're welcome to join, contribute, participate. And it's, we don't have to have show homes to have people to our houses. You know, sometimes we think we've got to have everything just right. And because we can't always do that, sometimes we go, well, we won't. What if we just lowered the bar a little bit and said, you know what? This is us. This is how we are, who we are. And you're welcome. You already have a meal. What does it look like to invite someone along, build community, and maybe just pause and pray. Just give thanks. Recognize God is present in it. Sometimes it's just repurposing things that we already do rather than trying to find a whole lot of new things to do. You know your life. You know how full it is. And we're going to take a moment and we're going to ask God, where can I find space? And see what God brings out. Because God knows your life as well. And he probably knows it better than you. And then let me ask you, 
Do you trust him enough that you would invite him to meet you in that space? As we pause, we're going to pray and we're going to ask God. And I invite you just in your own mind to, to be praying this prayer. God, would you help me to notice where I have space to invite you in? And then the second half of that prayer is, Lord, give me the courage to be present to you in that space. Because it's one thing to ask God to show you, it's another thing to have that step of faith to step into it, to be present to it, and to notice it. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to pause as your Holy Spirit is just present to us here. And as we sang that song just before the message about new wine, that we might lay down some old things, that we might experience a new way of being in you, a new flame, a new sense of your presence, an openness to your leading. Lord, you know all of our lives intimately. You know the areas where we have space. You know the things that we, we just fill our lives with to keep ourselves preoccupied. And Spirit of God, we ask you right now, in our heart of hearts, that you might just reveal something to us where we can repurpose something. where we might be able to invite you in. That we might become attentive to your voice. God, I ask that you would give us the faith and the courage to respond to the call you've placed in our heart. That we would become passionate followers of you who are willing to lay down the things of this world that we might become more present to the things of your kingdom. In Jesus' name.